The meeting will begin in one minute. The meeting will begin in one minute. Thank you. Okay, we'll call this meeting of the Land Use Committee to order. Thank you all for being here. Can I get a motion for the approval of the minutes from our last meeting? Second, I sir. Thank you, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you. Our agenda item today is a presentation on development and infrastructure, an update for Sioux Falls by Director Cooper and Director Cotter, are you on there too? Okay, well thanks guys for putting this together. I know it was kind of last minute, so thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Cooper with Planning and Building Services and Mark will be coming up here in a little bit. I also want to recognize in the room Jeff Schmidt and Albert Schmidt who helped provide a lot of the information to put this together. So the idea was uh, responding to some of the counselors inquiries just about development, uh, availability of development land, coordination with infrastructure and capital programming, all those kind of things. So we put together a lot of high level information as far as just broad based, how do we coordinate development and infrastructure. And I think one of the strengths of our administration is we have a really good record of the public works team, the planning team, finance, others working closely together. And Mark and I are starting to get used to doing these joint presentations, but uh, really happy to kind of go through some of this high level information. So to start out with, this is more from the, the planning growth management strategy, but it's kind of one of our guiding uh, policies or strategies that we're really looking at how can we shape the city of Sioux Falls as a place of choice that's guided by innovative plans and policies, land use requirements that are clearly defined and reasonable, and then how do we facilitate, facilitate minimum life safety standards for building projects through a customer service focused plan review, permitting and inspection. And this really does um, impact not only the planning and building services team, but also public works, because I think between our two departments, we're involved in just about every city project as well as every private development project to some degree. So in terms of growth management and the impact of development on the city, it always starts with employment because as we say, if we don't have jobs, then we're not gonna grow. And so we track much like with Tracy's monthly financial report on employment or unemployment rates. We look on a monthly basis, where are those growth trends as far as employment are the different sectors growing some faster than others, whether it's construction or the retail wholesale trades, whatever it might be. So as we say, employment is really the starting point of growth of a city like Sioux Falls. And so that has an impact in terms of population. Um, when we do our annual population estimates, uh, you know, we also look at those employment trends for that previous year. So we started out the year at 183,200, and as part of our long range planning process, we have projected out to the year 2040, quarter million population within the city of Sioux Falls. And that's based on some assumptions as far as our annual growth rates that would continue on in that two to 3% range. The public works team, as you heard uh, from Mark, when we recently worked on an update of our storm of our wastewater treatment plant and our wastewater system. 
we looked out 10, 20, 100 years of what the potential growth of the city might be. So we have employment, and then that relates into population growth, and then that relates to development. So this is kind of an interesting chart going back to 1985 of single family construction year by year. And you can see how the, the trends have, have changed over the different decades. Um, in the middle, we saw some real peaks in terms of single family before we hit the, the financial recession. And then we started making a comeback over the last five years. And then every year we do a map with our GIS team to plot out the locations of building permits. So for last year, these dots on the map show you where the different single family housing permits were approved. And another feature on this map is showing the city limits and how that overlays with the surrounding school district boundaries. So we can track where those housing permits were approved and how they're impacting the different school district boundaries. And I might just comment that both Mark and I are going to be participating in the Sioux Falls School District Facilities Task Force. In fact, we, we had our first meeting last night. So this is information that's not only useful in terms of tracking impacts on the schools, but also looking at where those development pressures are uh, for roads, for other infrastructure. The same thing with multifamily, and that really fluctuates a lot more historically than single family does as the market changes from year to year. Uh, we've gone through another five years of pretty robust multifamily construction, and we expect that we could see somewhat of a slowing of that in 2018. Um, this is a little bit harder to relate in terms of the number of apartment units because these building sites don't really reflect the, the density of some of those larger multifamily units. But again, these are the locations from last year of our permits for two family and multifamily projects. We also keep track every year of approved residential development sites. So this map is an inventory at the end of last year. All the different yellow boxes reflect approved subdivisions. And we keep track of those by name, as well as how many single family lots are potentially available, as well as how many potential multifamily housing units would potentially be available. And at the upper right hand corner of this map, you can see that those are summarized that within these existing approved subdivisions, we have just about 5,400 single family lots reflected and just over 4,500 multifamily housing units that could potentially develop. So the total inventory is just under 9,900 units. And if you go back to those historical uh, permit charts that I showed you, for single family, we could say that this could be anywhere from a four to a seven year inventory, depending on the market, and the same thing for, for multifamily. So we have uh, another way of tracking where that existing development land is available and what those market trends look like from year to year. On the non-residential side, this is from last year that shows the location of our commercial, industrial, institutional, and office building permits. And those are, are fairly well scattered around the city, which I think is really a good indicator because we're not necessarily pushing development in one particular area. So as we plan for development, as we plan for infrastructure, we're looking at pretty much all quadrants of the city, including the core area. We always like to see these dots, whether they're residential or non-residential, uh, pop up each year within our central or core areas. And then this is an inventory of overall vacant land within the current city limits of Sioux Falls. So the yellow areas are vacant land areas within the current city limits of Sioux Falls. And again, we, we have that, that 
summarized of total acres for agriculture, which is kind of the category that we use for vacant land, of just over 8,300 acres of land area. So again, we can see where, where we have approved development and then where, where we still have some vacant land area that's within our city limits, even before we start looking at, at additional annexation demands beyond what's currently available. So, part of the discussion today is how does the city manage the availability, the consumption of development land? How do we keep ahead of what's, of what's needed? Um, in some cases, are we seeing too much availability or not enough? And how do we monitor and coordinate that? So this is a chart that kind of summarizes going back to 1995, um, how the city has expanded in terms of annexation, rezonings, plats, and then it gives us a five-year and a, ten, a 15 year average in terms of, of the activity that we see of looking at different development activities. And then the bottom of the chart, going back to 2009 up to the present time, gives you an idea of how many acres are platted for those different kinds of land uses, whether they're residential, industrial, commercial, or office. And then it gives us an average. So for example, for residential, you can see that the average has been just over 400 acres of platted land per year. And the same thing for those non-residential. So again, that's a good uh, metric that we can use to monitor not only from our end, what, what's available, but also what the demand is going to be going forward. And so as part of our comprehensive planning process, looking out to the year 2040 with our Shape Sioux Falls comprehensive plan, we put together some future land consumption forecasts for all the different kinds of, of land uses. And this chart just kind of summarizes those formulas or those calculations that went into that looking at high, low demand throughout that future planning process going to the year 2040. And I think what's interesting to show you today is that in the middle of this chart, you can see that there's an acreage calculation and then there's what we call a multiplier. And the multiplier is a formula that we've used for quite some time as a way of helping to manage uh, what's, what's available in terms of our, of our development. So for instance, for single family residential, if we're calculating what that actual demand might be or that projected demand, we're putting a 50% multiplier on there and saying, let's, let's make sure that we have really more land than maybe what the demand is so that we're not limiting the market to any one particular area of the city. Um, we always are trying to be out ahead of demand because we don't know from year to year or from decade to dec decade how that's gonna fluctuate. So this is just kind of another way for us to look more long-term and uh, be a little conservative as far as identifying how much land is going to be needed and where that land is going to be identified for the different kinds of uses. And then this is our land use plan that's adopted as part of our comprehensive plan. And so when we bring to you um, rezonings or subdivision plans, there's always some type of a correlation of our 2040 comprehensive plan, as well as some of our capital projects that, that we look at going forward. So that's kind of a big picture of the planning end of things in terms of forecasting how much demand there's going to be for land, the different types of land uses, and how it fits into the overall comprehensive planning process. And then we start to drill down a little bit more specific as far as what we call growth areas. And within our planning process, we break it down into different categories of, of urbanized areas, which are those properties that have already been approved for development or that have been annexed. And then we have a planned urbanized area, um, future urbanized area, 
which I'm gonna have Mark talk a little bit about, and then the rural areas, which are outside of our growth area. And the one that we wanna focus the most on today, because we, if you've heard us talk about the tiers or the growth areas broken out by tiers, and that's a methodology that we've used for quite some time for planning, for public works, for others, again, to help manage where development is anticipated to occur and where the city expects to be investing in future infrastructure. So we go kind of hand in hand with both the public and the private side as far as looking at where uh, the resources are going to be prioritized on these different five, 10, 15 year increments. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mark a little bit now to continue on this discussion as far as moving from a more of a planning high level function to more of an engineering public works capital improvement function. So here you go, Mr. Cotter. And thank you for volunteering to do this, by the way, too. Yes, thank you both. You're welcome. Welcome, Director Cotter. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, uh, Council Chair and Committee, um, for getting us on your agenda today. We put this uh, graphic up that shows the, the expected growth boundaries for the city of Sioux Falls, uh, as well as the work that's been done with Crooks, Brandon, T, and Harrisburg, um, because all of us um, are enjoying this very proactive growth that we've got to be working together as neighbors to make sure that um, we can uh, understand each other's growth patterns, uh, regionalize if possible to uh, capture that economy of scale, but then ultimately just uh, so e everybody has a good, uh, clear path forward. Sanitary sewer is the foundation of growth. And so when you drive around the outskirts of the city and you, and you wonder, gosh, why isn't that land being developed? Um, it first starts with topography and it starts with sanitary sewer. And when, one of the things that uh, planning and public works uh, really do, and we do it frequently, is reach out to the development community, get an understanding of the market, where the absorption's happening, um, and get a perspective of, of what direction that they feel like they're heading. So in our planning uh, process, we can incorporate that and ultimately, as Mike said, always have a strong supply of development land. We also always want them to know the direction that we're going and so we can, we can be out there seven, eight, 10 years ahead of development so there's always an adequate supply of, of development. But sanitary sewer is always the foundation and, and often when you're, say you're on the, your way out to Good Earth, people will say, why isn't this land developed? Well, that's in uh, likely a future uh, sanitary sewer se basin that just hasn't been opened up yet because today we have adequate supplies. Okay. Um, when you look at the various colors on this map, as Mike touched on it, tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one is it's either served today or will be within a five year period of time. Okay, and that's shown on that map in blue. Um, if it's tier two, that means that we're anticipating that land to be served in year basically six through 15, and tier three is in year 16 through 25. All right, this is a map that we have as, as land owners are coming in and, and trying to understand what is their sanitary sewer cost recovery. Um, essentially, when we open up a sanitary sewer uh, basin, the benefiting properties pay for the cost of that collection system. And so they'll look on this uh, map and there's a number of different cost recoveries. The key ones are the west side cost recovery and the east side cost recovery, that purple and the yellow. Um, and as you look at that, the west side cost recovery was uh, constructed a number of years ago that has a current cost recovery of just under $2,200 per acre. And the east side cost recovery, it has a cost of about $5,000 an acre, okay? So as you look at that map, we start to then look at um, the availability that exists in those areas to make sure that we can always stay ahead of uh, development. I'll give you a perspective just so you um, can understand what it costs to open up these areas and the larger the areas we can open up at once, we can uh, take advantage of uh, economy of scale. 
you can, you know, if you envision a valley and where that rain ultimately falls in a valley, we want to put the sewer at the lowest point of the valley and serve um, basically from ridgeline to ridgeline. Okay, so when the west side was opened up and that resolution was adopted back in 2001, that total project cost was about $24 million. And essentially what that does is that either lays the main trunk lines and or lift stations based on uh, what's needed to open that up and, and force mains. The, the amount that has been paid back on that as, as that land has been matured is just, uh, just over $8 million. So there's about $13.5 million that we still expect to collect as land develops on the west side of Sioux Falls. The east side, um, again, opened up a significant part of our current growth area, um, essentially all the way out to the Big Sioux River. And when that was adopted, uh, that resolution was adopted back in 2009, uh, the total project cost to open up the east side with that major lift station, piping all the way up to the plant, and then a system of large trunk mains that brings the wastewater to that pump station, that total project cost was $40.5 million. Um, the amount that still remains to be paid in um, is about $29 million. So about 75% of that is yet to be matured, but also to be paid. So if that gives you a perspective, and that's why when we talk about our next area to open up will be on the west side over by Cherry Lake so we can still capture uh, that area. We try to time those as appropriately with um, maintaining an appropriate supply of available land. All right, so um, I just had shared some of the financial dollars overall. On the west side uh, cost recovery area, there's still 6,200 acres remaining in the west side to be uh, developed and matured, and on the east side about 7,700 uh, acres, okay? Give you a perspective uh, where the capital uh, dollars get directed to in the city. Uh, the first graphic on the left uh, shows that um, essentially roads and utilities uh, take the lion's share of the capital dollars uh, to continue to move this city forward and also take advantage of uh, this progressive growth. And then the sources of where those dollars come from, uh, sales tax, user fees, and state loans, those are the three fundamental funding sources to fund the capital plan. All right, this is the map that you're probably very familiar with. This, this gives everyone a picture when we talk to groups in town. They always want us to either bring the 2018 capital improvement map. This one is the 2018 to 2022 capital improvement map, so it's a five-year map. It includes the City of Sioux Falls projects along with the State of South Dakota projects. And I'll just hit a couple of the, the probably the key ones. And so if we start in the upper right-hand corner, that red, number 22, that's the final connection of Veterans Parkway to I-90. Uh, the governor made a commitment uh, that uh, by the end of 2019, we would have Veterans Parkway connected to I-90, and he's fulfilled that commitment with bidding this last uh, piece. It has five bridges on it, a uh, substantial amount of road construction in a short area. It's about a $55 million project that the state has uh, paid, and you'll see a lot of activity out in that northeast area uh, this summer. You come down on on that uh, area of Arrowhead Parkway. Arrowhead Parkway was bid last year and they had a, a key intersection that they needed to get done last year. For this year, we'll finish out the rest of that and really bring a modern arterial street, um, one of our key east-west corridors uh, that bring uh, people through and across the city. So if you're on that side of town, you'll see a substantial amount of work that's happening there. Uh, if you come south, uh, another state project, uh, that red line that's number 15, that's a, a DOT-funded project that's three-mile urban uh, arterial street that will essentially go from 85th of Minnesota down to the Harrisburg corner. And the state of South Dakota is still working with about 20 landowners to 
procure the necessary rights of way. Uh, they certainly hope to be able to complete those transactions this year and then uh, uh, bid that project. That'll be a significant uh, entrance into the city of Sioux Falls, not only for T and Harrisburg, but Northwest Iowa, Canton, uh, Worthing, all those daily commuters that come in and out be a nice, safe uh, uh, corridor for people to make their daily commutes. As we make our way around the red line that's on the extreme west side or the um, left-hand side of the map, that's our flagship project for this year. That's the T. Ellis Road project, just under two million, uh, just under two miles. It's twelve point two million dollars uh, worth of work, doing strategic closures to build that as efficiently as possible. That's underway as we speak. Um, really, will scale up and be the backbone transportation for uh, the west side of Sioux Falls once that's completed. Okay. If you have any others, I'm certainly willing to go through them. It's going to be a very active construction season this year, not only with road work, uh, drainage improvements, uh, to continue to advance our infrastructure. And I think this one's Michael's. There you go. This is where we get the applause, so you might want to stay up here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the, the conclusion is, you know, we're always looking into the future uh, based on our historic growth rates. Over 2,500 new housing units each year. We see how many people come into our community each year, the growth in jobs. And we have to be prepared for that in terms of infrastructure, parks, schools, other types of buildings. And more discussions about going forward of how we continue to coordinate the projected development and the coordination with our capital program. So it is very um, demanding. We put a lot of effort into it as well as the city council does as far as looking at this each year, the five-year plan. But the message today is just to kind of give you a quick overview of how do we, again, as the administration, try to manage this growth of the city in terms of looking at the future development, future land uses, and tying that in with trying to help prioritize where our city investments are for, for infrastructure and other city facilities. So I hope that this is kind of a quick overview that is of informational and um, guidance to you. And I'll just also put a plug in that we just completed our 2017 Sioux Falls Development Summary that will be available online that gives a little bit more detail about uh, what happened in terms of 2017 for development activity. So with that, we'll take any questions or comments that you have. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for that presentation. Any questions from the committee? Councilor Kiley? Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, both directors and, and their staff because uh, in just the last few weeks, I've attended a few meetings now where you've presented information of this type to other community organizations, one being the uh, at our monthly breakfast that we have with school district superintendents and, and county commissioners, both Lincoln as well as Minnehaha County. And I know that the school district uh, superintendents greatly appreciated the presentation a few weeks back. And maybe you could just address the close relationship that you have with other governmental entities as uh, well, uh, and school, including the school districts uh, and uh, private businesses because this is a type of information that is vitally important for them too as they plan. Director Cooper. I'll just start, um, if I can scan back to one of our maps that shows the school district boundaries. <clears throat> because yes, we do we, spend we a lot of time. And we actually have eight, eight school districts within our. So again, you can kind of see on the exhibit of the different school boundaries in the middle of Sioux Falls, Brandon Valley to the east. We have a little corner of Canton School District and then Harrisburg on the south side, T area school district, Lenox West Central and Tri-Valley. So in terms of coordinating with the different school districts, the different superintendents, uh, that's a, a major part of our future planning or long range planning effort. And then as Mark stated, um, one of the other graphics as he's gone out and talked to the other <clears throat> communities around Sioux Falls in terms of that regional 
uh, infrastructure. Maybe you can just comment a little bit more about that, how much emphasis we try to put on that as well. Uh, certainly, uh, it's been a number of years, but uh, the city council and um, our state regulators and, and all the uh, partners that are around the city of Sioux Falls, we invited them to a discussion on regional, regionalizing wastewater. And since then, um, we've had great discussions with Brandon. They've signed a long-term contract. Uh, the city of T actually acted on theirs last night, and we're working to calendar uh, with you an informational meeting in the near future, and then bring forward that contract. And, and all those governances um, are essentially in ordinance. And so when you see um, your fellow colleagues in T, you can certainly understand that that's, uh, that's been a great relationship. We've got um, uh, had a number of uh, discussions with the city of Harrisburg, and they're still evaluating and doing their due diligence on whether they build their own treatment plant or um, come to the regional system. It's looking like they're going to build their own plant, and so we'll uh, work with them on uh, anything that we can. Uh, they're connected to the city of Sioux Falls today. But we really have really good relationships. Um, we have to, as we develop this metro area, um, so anytime we can take advantage of regionalizing services uh, to reduce the cost to deliver, that's what the customers expect, and that's what we do uh, as often as we can. Okay, very good. Mr. Chair, if I may continue. Yes. Uh, and, and just last week, both of you presented to a chamber event, the uh, Good Morning Sioux Falls, which uh, our, our committee chair actually uh, emceed that, and it was a great job. By the way, I, I left my chamber news in the office, but I do, if you would, Director Cooper and Cotter, if you would mind signing my copy after the meeting, I would appreciate that. Uh, I didn't take you up on that last week. Inside but joke. My, my point is that there's a lot of other individuals and organizations that are relying on this information other than just our immediate needs here in the city of Sioux Falls. It's, it's the other communities around us, the school districts and, and the counties, and you both do a great job of providing that information, so I thank you. Now, when we're looking at our population projections, I couldn't help but notice that our projection for 2020 is 185,000. And I would be surprised if we're not close to 185 right now today, based on our growth of last year's growth of nearly 5,000 people. And so we're a third of the way through. So how does that impact your, your projections here? Do you, how often do you uh, make adjustments to these projections so that you can do your job? Right, and I mean, there's a more detailed version of this in the plan that gives kind of a low, medium, and high. And so we, we always try to do a range because our crystal ball is never perfect. But in looking at the future forecast for population, we like to include more of a range. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it needs to be updated every year in terms of what that actual estimate is. And then in terms of our comprehensive plan, we typically like to come back and review that on a five-year basis to, to look at those demographics. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Staley. Uh, a few comments and questions. Uh, first of all, with a comment, if, if you, um, I know in, in some instances when we have these slides, they're, they're numbered, that, that really is helpful if we could, you know, put that on here for reference purposes. Thank you. Um, so a few questions. Uh, I went to a mayoral debate at the Oakview Neighborhood Association a few weeks ago, and they made a comment during that that we're kind of oversaturated with apartments at this time. And I, I thought that was strange because I know we're, we're building these new apartments and, and then it, the, the conversation came up that maybe what, what we are lacking is affordable uh, housing versus just apartments in general. Could you address that? I mean, are we, are we, do we have too many apartments? Or is there a high vacancy number for just market value, market rate apartments? Sure. And I think this, again, from last year shows you the different locations for the multifamily. And so we're not concentrating all of those in one particular geographical area. I think the Oakview neighborhood, as we've gone through previous discussion about the rezoning of 6th and Bonson, there's still some of that, that that they're talking about. So the city planning office, the city public works department, we don't 
say, uh, or community development, wherever the case might be, we're not the ones that are identifying where the multifamily housing project should go. But what we are doing is, again, we're saying, okay, the developers have come to us and they've asked to have these different locations approved for a variety of housing types, whether they're going to be single family or multifamily or a combination of all of the above. And the market trends do change from year to year. Um, but we do look at, um, in terms of the question about saturation of any type of housing market, and we do try to, to spread that out as much as we can. I think the other thing about the affordability counselor is that from my experience, people have different definitions of what we mean by affordable. Mm -hmm. And so it's really all across the board as far as what, what we need in terms of housing for the city. And again, what this map doesn't show you is that every year when we participate in, in working with affordable housing projects with developers, we are trying to move those around at different locations. So those are not even being concentrated in any one particular quadrant of the city from year to year. So that's kind of a general vague response, but I would just say that one of our land use policies is that we try to provide for a variety of housing types in all areas of the city. But when I, I, when I hear that, when, talking about market rate, market rate apartments, I'm thinking that kind of resolves itself too. I wouldn't think a developer wants to build an apartment if there's not a a currently a demand. Yep. So yep. that, but I, I, it surprised me because I, I ha thought we had a, sh a housing shortage just in general mm -hmm. for our people, but maybe it's a specific segment of our community that needs more housing. Okay, the second thing is um, you talked on a slide, which I can't identify here, but. We we're talking about the core area, building permits, and you made the statement that you like to see more building permits, more development ex ex uh, in the downtown, in the core area. Yes. Yes, and, and so my, my question was, how does that look? Are we talking about, if someone was, is going to be guild, uh, building a new building downtown, are we talking about taking down housing, taking down an existing business, how does that look? So for me, it's primarily, let's start with the residential side. So in the middle of this map, the yellow dots are the single family housing permits. Um, some of those were on vacant lots that have been acquired by a developer or even by our community. I'm, I'm talking about the commercial okay. aspect. Okay, now. Let's skip forward to that then. So here's our commercial building permits. Yes. And again, you can see are those commercial, if they're red, are they industrial, the different color codes. And I would say beyond the downtown area per se, we're always looking at those neighborhoods around the downtown, whether it's along Minnesota Avenue or 10th Street. Um, and you know the Pettigrew Heights area, the Whittier area, what type of non-residential development can we encourage or that would be appropriate to continue to serve those older neighborhoods? That's what I'm talking about as far as what we would like to see so that we're not pushing all, and we're not pushing, but that we're not seeing all the new non-residential construction just in those outlying corners of the city. But if a business, the business is going to have, if we're talking about commercial business moving in, what, what is that going on top of? I mean, are we talking about, because there's not vacant, unless you're talking about a vacant lot that's going to build something or yeah, something has be, to go. Sure. There may be a vacant lot or there may be a teardown of an existing older business that's being replaced by a larger new business. Um, we, we've seen some of that along uh, more of the 41st Street and Minnesota Avenue that some of those businesses are replaced with, with new construction. And I think you'll continue to see some of that um, along those major arterial roadways. But specifically to the downtown, um, you know, we are seeing some ongoing reuse of, of vacant lots or repurposing of existing development. And that's just kind of where the, the market is taking us as far as those future demands 
for some of those non-residential building projects. And then I've got a third one if so. Okay. Um, on the annexation slide, and you're talking about the tier one properties here, um, if we could bring that up. Nope. Describe me which one you're looking at since I didn't put the it's, page numbers. Well, it had the tiers on There we there. go. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, is that split rock over there in the upper right hand, the blue? I, I, there's no, I can't see which, because the tier one is the blues. Yep. Yeah, so in the upper right hand there is that, what is yep. that? That's the split rock heights neighborhood. So yep. they're tier one. And, well, and you said that that is advising annexation. Yeah, they're actually within the existing, they're actually surrounded by the existing city limit boundaries. So all of the unannexed properties are kind of in that general category that you see up on the map. Right, but you're saying tier one annexation advised. So are they, because I, I mean, we. We're not, so, we're not changing our direction on that. So yes, we are not pursuing annexation of Split Rock Heights. I can say okay. that publicly today. Well, well, and then I'm one, like is Prairie <laughs> Meadows over on, I, I'm, on the uh, the west side, yeah, and mm -hmm. then is Pine Lake Hills identified on here? Where, what would color is that going to be? That's up in the northeast area. So that's that's again out there in that general. We didn't take the we didn't make this detail that shows every existing rural subdivision. It's just more of a general category. I understand, but well, I'm just curious. Skyline Heights. Well, what's this? What what area is that up on the north area then? Who's that block on the very north, on the northwest side? Who is that? Oh, is that the squares? Go, go to the south, Mark. Right there. Yep, yeah. that's Skyline Heights up in that area. So there's and Martin Martindale is in there too. Yep, yep. Okay. So those those existing pockets of unannexed land, we're just showing generally how they are are in this overall growth area. Okay. Yeah, I was just a little concerned when it says recommended. Annexation advised that so let they, me, they would they would be concerned let me, to see let, that. Let's clarify that today that that's not the intent. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. okay. Thank you, <laughs> Councilor Nitzer. Sure. And I I definitely could understand when it says annexation advised. I I think the only reason it may be that color is because it they already could be serviced today, yeah. or within five years they could be could serviced. Be. Yeah. But that has nothing to do with the timeline the city has of wanting to annex them that's correct it yes. just so happens that we could just hook them up tomorrow and so they're that's why they're that color and it's nothing more than that that's correct that's a good explanation thank you okay <laughs> it's something people bring up to me uh, particularly from that have moved from other big cities is kind of an intriguing idea and I don't know how I feel about it if you've looked into it is the idea of impact fees and they like as an example okay, you want to expand your hospital campus and you're going to take down 20 single family <coughs> homes, but you're going to pay X amount of dollars into the community development fund that we're going to use that we can build affordable housing or some other mechanism. Has that, has that ever been discussed in the pros and cons? Many times. Um, it has okay. been discussed on multiple occasions in the past. And, <clears throat> and I'm going to have Mark come up here again because where we have landed as a city in terms of development impacts is on our platting fees. That's where we came. We did not go into a traditional impact fee, but we, we put together a, a consulting firm that helped us come up with a, a nexus test that eventually led to our, our platting fees and our other um, fees when you plat property and how that goes into our, our enterprise fund. So maybe we can just give a quick synopsis of how that came together. Sure, thank you. Okay, so fundamentally, we sat down with the development community um, about 10 years ago now because in that 2005 through 2008 run, the city was growing at a substantial rate, and the development community also recognized that there's only so many sales tax dollars available and that they felt like the sort of the critical mass of the size of the city, it was time for development to pay um, some amount of the growth of some of these uh, arterial streets and water mains. So there was a group that met, um, we met every two weeks for 18 months. Um, it was usually almost 30 people attended every meeting. And we started to uh, really work through, first we, we wanted to fundamentally come up with 
how much of those arterial streets should development pay for? And the nexus test uh, that we came up with, because many people enjoy the use of an arterial street, but when you um, forecast out an arterial street, you're opening up a land on both sides of it, okay? And so the, the test ultimately came was that we, that we arrived at is that land, landowners or developers should pay 30% of the cost of that arterial street, okay? So then it becomes, okay, how do we get that? And we looked at City of Lincoln, Nebraska has impact fees. And if you look there from everything from a C store through a movie theater, movie theater is one of the highest trip generators, impact trip generators. And so you're gonna pay some of the highest amounts of impact fees because of how their traffic comes in. It all comes in right at the start of the movie and it all leaves right at the, start of the, at the end of the movie. Um, there's other uh, areas like a Campbell Supply that gets a routine amount of traffic throughout the course of the day, and that would pay different because it's all, the fundamental is based on traffic. Well, if you have impact fees, that's at when the building permit is pulled. And one of our struggles at the time was we wanted to be building with development. And so instead of waiting for all the land to be developed, and then collecting a fee at the building permit stage, we came up with, well, what's the first thing that happens? Platting. And so they agreed, which requires them to outlay more dollars up front before they sell a lot, um, uh, negotiate a deal. Um, but it was the right thing for the city because we said we wanted to be out there with development at the front side and not building behind. And so the fundamental premise of we have what we call development fees. Some would maybe characterize them as impact fees, but true impact fees are based on square footage of a facility based on its traffic use. Our platting fees are also based on traffic trips, only we correlate them to the land use, and then ultimately we collect them at the plat stage so we can get those dollars up front and be designing and constructing with development instead of behind. Does that help? So that, that helps in that particular component when we're talking about those sorts of impacts on infrastructure, building new infrastructure, but I'm, let's say designating maybe a neighborhood in the city, it's already been platted as we're considering this an at-risk neighborhood for lack of a better term. And so if you're gonna take down housing stock in that area, you've gotta do something to whatever. Maybe you put 50,000 bucks in for each lot into a community development so they have money to do more development somewhere else because it, 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 maybe you make a policy decision as a city that we're recognizing that affordable housing is a problem and so if you're going to take out affordable housing you're going to put money back in mm -hmm. that's what i'm getting at yeah and you'll see different cities they'll have an impact fee for a park they'll have an impact fee for a fire station we as a city have not um, gone down that road and and at this point wouldn't be recommending that um, and but those are all decisions that cities uh, uh, discuss and policy gets set. Um, but I would tell you that it's been a really good, um, I think, solution for the city. Um, will it be our long-term strategy? I don't know. It's still only, you know, we went in, we, we started implementing platting fees um, of arterial streets and water mains in the uh, January of 2009. And so I think we've still got some time to understand if this is going to be our long-term strategy. Okay. I think another uh, issue that, like the map that we have up here on the screen with those future cost recovery areas, in those lo locations we're starting out with vacant or agricultural land and we're putting all the infrastructure in place for development. Within more of the existing core area or, or uh, more of the historical areas, in many cases that infrastructure is already there. So if you are looking at redevelopment along a Minnesota Avenue or a 41st Street or a Whittier neighborhood or a Pettigrew Heights neighborhood, in most cases, the infrastructure is already there. You don't have to add to it. And that actually helps because that makes development more affordable in many cases. And you can even look at higher density development and make use of that infrastructure to make it uh, even more financially feasible. So that's kind of the discussions that we've had back and forth over the years. Sure. Well, it's a struggle because Again, as you lose housing in the core, that means somebody's building another apartment complex 
on the fringe and we're sprawling and sprawling and that means more roads we have to plow and things we have to service and mm -hmm. and uh, just not getting into uncontrolled growth I guess right and I think it's I mean it's a good topic because we still have you know key universities that are right in the heart of our city we have hospitals that are right in the heart of the city and if they're going to grow they're going to probably absorb some of those neighborhoods um, the way ours is set up is, is say a, a university buys 10 houses because they're going to build another facility, a dormitory or something. They can elect to just leave those 10 lots as they were platted for single family development and build on them. It just has a long uh, legal description. It may say lots 1 through 10 of XYZ. Um, if they replat that, that's when we will collect a platting fee and it'll be the gap between residential if that was what the underlying use was and if it goes to say um, commercial then we'll charge them the difference for that particular so those things happen in the core um, you know wasn't very long ago that the uh, Sanford Health built a, a hotel right next to their campus how that was organized financially required it to be under one plat and so they ultimately paid that gap difference okay so there's a lot of different scenarios i think too we have to realize that um, the infrastructure is there but for those institutions whether they're um, whether they're a university or a hospital if they're absorbing those houses that's a very expensive land to have to buy for them to still invest in the core and so you know, when you start to look at um, if it's four houses that creates an acre of land, well, and if if a typical house in the core is somewhere be around, say, $150,000, you start to do the math. They're making a significant investment to stay in the core and to continue to grow and absorb. So um, they go through a number of business transactions um, when they consider those moves. Okay. Sure. And I would, I'll just finish and then I'll defer. I. Yeah, and I just want to make sure it's clear that this is not an anti-hospital or anti-institutional. I mean, they're doing wonderful things in the core, but it's just the affordable housing impact. So I'll defer for anything Councilor else. Councilor Staley? Well, and Councilor Neitzer, thank you for bringing that up because I, um, having, I live by Avera, and I've seen neighborhood, I mean, we've lost so many homes. Um, so it's a great concern for people getting into affordable housing because once that house is gone, you aren't going to be able to go out and replicate that house on the outskirts of town for for 120, 150 thousand. So uh, what I I would like to request, and I don't, hopefully you can find this, is how many homes have we actually lost in the hospital expansions? What is what is that number? I, I would think at some point we could we could recoup that or get that number, and then I I guess I would say an impact fee would be something to look at because the platting fees of course you're, you are talking about new development and having I know the Avera project out north of town was so wonderful taking those neat homes they've got a lot of character by the way and every time I go walking in that neighborhood and I see some of these homes are gone it just breaks my heart because they will never be replicated in these new developments so um, having my understanding is moving them into a different plot of land was so expensive that by the time it was done you might as well build new um, so they were just demolished but I so I would like if you could find some kind of a number as to how many of those homes we've lost and then um, also I think moving ahead that's something we could consider thanks for bringing it up councillor Neitzert I would just like to address that a little bit because I think this is the second time that has come up. It's true that we've lost a number of residential homes because of the expansion of our medical facilities within the city, but that is expanses, expansion has served the citizens of Sioux Falls, surrounding area, the surrounding region so importantly, and uh, the lives saved as a, uh, as a result of the medical services that are available here for our citizens is invaluable as well. And I do understand the counselor's concern uh, regarding affordable housing, but there is certainly 
uh, an upside to this story as well, too, and I think that it's important that that is represented, too. Thank you. Do you have anything else? Yeah, and I, I concur with that, and, I, and again, I hope it's clear. I don't think any of us were going on an anti-hospital rant. They're both wonderful organizations, but there's obviously pros and cons to uh, anything. When you talk about supply of 10-year supply and things like that of land, is there an industry metric that tells you how much is too much of a glut and how much is not enough that you need to keep ahead? I mean, there's got to be some point at which you got way too much, and it's, you know, why is 10 years a magic number or whatever it may be? So we look out, um, as far as the planning function, we're always looking out probably 20 years into the future of trying to project the growth of the city and where those growth areas are going to be identified. In terms of the availability of land on a year-to-year -year basis, as Mark said, we, we spend a lot of time talking to developers, builders, other people that are investing in the city and trying to understand how far out into the future are they planning for their investments. And so that, that range of five to 10 years is pretty typical for residential, whether it's single family or multifamily. And as I mentioned earlier with our multiplier, we're always trying to have more than what the estimated demand is going to is going to identify. So I think we're, we're pretty good um, as far as what the, you might call the industry standard would be for looking into the future. Okay, and last question for Director Cotter, number nine on the highways and streets. Looks like, and it might be a seven as well, Minnesota basically from Russell going down to 18th Street. Yes. I know what I would like to see, but what, what is planned? It, mine would be a complete, <coughs> You know, it would look completely different and it would be a grand entrance into downtown, but what do we have planned? Well, you're on the committee then. Um, we are actually just starting to develop the RFP that will solicit uh, proposals because we do expect this to be a gateway. We've got, we've seen a substantial amount of development, redevelopment along Minnesota Avenue as the gateway. And we've got a lot of pedestrians that use it. We have, um, we still have some single family housing that's along there that, um, today, some of them park on the street. For the majority of Minnesota Avenue, parking has been removed. But the pavement's tired. Um, access on uh, is every block, and we don't build arterial streets like that. And so we're looking at some access management control, but still wanting to have that uh, feel of coming into our city. And so we have done some uh, preliminary plans, and it, they've been a years um, ago, right? Um, but we are starting to gear up for this because, you know, some of the first phases are in 2020. And that sounds like it's a long time out, but when you're doing the, you know, starting to develop the concept plan and engaging the community, those things will take a series of meetings for us to ultimately come forward and say, this is the, what the city wants that corridor of Minnesota to be. So I would just tell you we're in the very uh, early stages. We're in the infancy. There'll be a lot of public engagement. Uh, we are just in the process right now of trying to scope what needs to be done underground and what we'd like to happen above ground, and then we'll we'll select the the strongest proposal to help guide us through that. Just for your perspective, the uh, water plant is on the north end of Minnesota Avenue, and one of our key lifelines comes down Minnesota Avenue that fills ultimately the Menlo Tower and and others and so we're going to be rehabilitating that large water main which is um, critical for us to have another 75 year pipe in the ground but then above ground you'll see access management better better uh, pedestrian facilities better lighting things of that nature so it should be a very exciting project I would just close by saying I hope that we look at maybe instead of just building a bunch of lanes we think about connectivity for pedestrians over to the neighborhoods mm -hmm. to the west. So that's LinkedIn, uh, making it very multimodal. And I know it's an arterial that goes through, but maybe we slow them, do things to slow them down in the downtown town area to make it mm -hmm. safer to cross. And just a, a beautiful redo, not just six lanes and a, a super highway right. that people right. are scared to try to go across. No, very good. Um, thank you for your feedback. All right, great discussion. Anybody else? I had a couple of quick questions. Um, 
That three mile stretch of road from 85th in Minnesota to Harrisburg, you probably said this and I missed it, but what was the cost on that and what's the timeline again? Um, I don't have the estimated cost, but the, the intention was to bid it this year. They'd like to bid it in this fiscal year, Councilor, so that may be sometime between now and September. And then that level of a project probably takes a full 18 months to get done once the contractors have been hired and they can actually start. So, um, but I can follow back up on what the state's uh, estimated construction value is. Great, thank you. Okay. And then the, the Veteran Parkway stretch to I-90, is that, that 55 million, was that all state paid? It all is state. all state paid. That's what I thought, mm -hmm. okay. Um, one other question on the statistic. So on average, we're platting 406 acres a year for residential development, is that right? Yes, and then overall, just over <coughs> 600, 600 acres so we're for everything total. Okay. So about two thirds a year is residential. Two th okay. Of our total platted land. Gotcha, I found that interesting. And then the other, last thing was an observation. I don't even know if you'll have a comment, but I, I found it interesting when you talked on the single family construction, as busy as the market's been, and we hear about that all the time too, the last few years, it doesn't even seem to sniff what it was like in the mid 2000s. But if you look the the side by side charts, multifamily was a lot less during those years than single family. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. All right. Super. Well, thanks so much for that. Again, thanks for putting that together. Kind of yeah, last. Yeah. Thank you for, for the uh, invitation. And again, the the purpose of today was just to kind of talk about the relationship between planning for the development, uh, identifying the infrastructure that we need to accommodate that development, and then prioritizing the financing. So. We appreciate your involvement, and uh, I know we'll have some further discussions as we go into the next budget cycle with, with our CIP projects. Right. Thank you. All right. Open discussion. Anybody have anything for that? We're good? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. With that, we'll adjourn the meeting.